have each other. We're trying to get a board sometime. Uh, no, that's we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us al-ikhlas fil qawli wal amal to give us sincerity to him in the things that we say and in the things that we do seeking his face and one of the most tremendous of things of the actions of drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we know is by way of recitation of Quran. It's one of the most tremendous actions of worship. One of the most noble things that a person can involve himself in and from the best of speech, from the best of statements that a person can train his tongue and train his soul to be continuous in utilizing it, speaking by way of it, contemplating over it, memorizing it, and most important, of course, acting in accordance to that which the Qur'an has come down with or has been sent down for. In mentioning that, In speaking about the intention and how important it is that one purifies their intentions when doing these actions that are actions that draw one near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they are actions that take great effort and they are actions that take great time and they are actions that take great sacrifice and they are actions that take a loss sometimes of dunya. And to look at these particular things from that standpoint and a person does not purify his intention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to go through all of this and to end up with nothing, Ya Muqiyama, this is a musibah. This is a tremendous calamity upon the human being. So we learn Quran and we come to these classes and we begin to put ourselves upon a program in dealing with the Quran and developing a relationship with the Quran so that we can ultimately be amongst those people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has considered to be Ahlullahi Haqqa considered to be the people, the true people of Allah Ahlul Qur'an, Ahlullahi Haqqa the people of Qur'an are the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so after being able to learn how to recite the Qur'an properly being able to implement the ahkam of tajweed and to recite Qur'an in a manner in which it was revealed, then of course this is not going to be of a full benefit until the person begins to understand what it is that he is saying so that he can also fulfill one of the most important of the reasons and objectives behind the Qur'an is that tadabbur, <coughs> is to be able to reflect and to be able to ponder and think about what it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. A person does not want to learn tajweed of Qur'an for the sake of being able to be said about him that his recitation is beautiful. His recitation sounds good. No doubt about it, if that is said, alhamdulillah, this is from Allah. But this is not the objective, right? The objective is so that you can understand what your Lord is saying to you You can ponder over what your Lord is saying to you. You can see the miracle of the Qur'an. You can appreciate the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can teach the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to others. But that is a very important point. 
as we find in Surah Al-Qiyamah, the methodology of learning Qur'an is right in that surah. As many of the Mufassirun, mufassirun they say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallam, لا تحرك بلسانك لتعجل بي Do not rush with your tongue, be in haste to recite. Meaning when Jibreel used to come to the Messenger of Allah sallam, he would rehearse the Qur'an with the Messenger of Allah and before Jibreel could finish what it was he was bringing to the Messenger of Allah and rehearsing with the Messenger of Allah of the Qur'an, alayhi salatu was salam, the Messenger of Allah would be already ready to recite after Jibreel. Right? So don't rush and don't be hasty. This means what? When you're learning and your teacher is teaching you, that you are patient, that you wait, and that you observe what it, ab, 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 absorb what it is that your teacher is teaching you, and then after he has taught you that portion, then you repeat, and then you begin to recite what it is that you have been taught, not hastening before the teacher, right? Not being in a rush before the teacher has taught you something, or even proceeding in your questioning. Wait until the teacher has taught you that portion, and then you implement what it is that he has taught you. Right? Inna alayna jam'ahu wa qur'ana. Because what? That first portion of what? Of it is what? Is learning how to say it properly. From your teacher. Learning what it is that you've been giving and repeating after your teacher. That is from the tajweed. That is from the recitation. And then Allah Ta'ala said it is upon us jam'ahu wa qur'ana. And it is upon us to what? To gather it. Right? This is from and for it to be recited. For it to be memorized. Meaning, this is your next stage of learning Quran. After you learn how to recite it properly, then you go into memorization. You don't go into memorization before you learn how to recite it properly. Because then what's going to happen? You're going to have to go back and re-memorize everything you memorize. Right? Because you didn't memorize it properly. So, a hift of Qur'an comes after learning how to actually say it properly. Then it is upon us to do what? Give its explanation, give its tafsir. So these are the maratib, these are the stages in learning Qur'an. And this is the stage that you're in now. Don't rush. Take your time and learn what it is that you're learning from the tajweed first. Then when you learn, as you learn, begin to implement and begin to recite and go memorize based upon what it is that you learned of pro proper recitation. And then after that, or even within that, and while you're doing that, if you have the time, and you begin to understand the verses as they should be understood from their tafsir. What is the meaning of this? All right? So these are some of the things that we're going to do after you are learning your ahkam of tajweed. We're going to learn the Qur'an in the methodology of the Qur'an and the way the Prophet ﷺ learned it. This is the way that you come out what? most successful. This is the way that you come out most successful. But today, bi as an introduction, we want to deal with something that's very important to give you that desire to make sure that you continue and to put you on the right path and to give yourself some type of uh, strength and some type of encouragement in doing what it is that you're doing. And that is something that we want to ponder over, and that's one verse of the Qur'an, or a portion of the verse, a portion of a verse in the Qur'an. And that is in Surah Al-Hashr. Surah Al-Hashr, ayah 21. That would be what, 59? 59, right? Maybe 50, the 59th chapter, the Surah Al Hashar. Uh, In this particular surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions 
in the 21st ayah. لَوْ أَنْزَوْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِئًا مُتَصَدِّيًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَأَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah Ta'ala, he says, we translate and interpret this verse to mean into the English language, that if we would have sent this Qur'an down, revealed it upon a mountain, if we would have revealed this Qur'an upon a mountain, if we would have made this Qur'an come down and caused the mountain and placed it as an obligation of the mountain to carry this Qur'an, the speech of Allah Ta'ala, لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِئًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِّنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ Then you would have found this mountain, خَاشِئًا You would have found this mountain in a state of what? خُشُور You would have found that this mountain would have went into a state of submissiveness, humility, softness, right? مُتَصَدِّعًا مِّنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ Crumbling to pieces. Humbling itself, this hard mountain, this solid structure, out of what? Out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of khashya of Allah, the type of fear that is joined with knowledge of the verses, of the speech of his Lord being sent down upon it. وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَدْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And these are the type of examples that Allah ta'ala brings forth in the Qur'an for the people so that they can do what? So they can think about this example. Not so that they can recite it and say, this sounds beautiful. Huh? Not so they can beautify the recitation of this verse here, but for the purpose of thinking about these particular examples and reflecting over what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really saying. Because there's a deep, deep, deep meaning to this in connection to the actual people in which the Qur'an was sent down to. It wasn't sent down to the mountains. It wasn't sent down to the trees. It wasn't sent down to the animals. Right? It was sent down to the human being and the jinn. And if a mountain, as solid as a mountain is, if you ever really looked at the mountains, maybe some of the people from the city they don't, haven't seen really looked at mountains like that except on television. But if you really went out into the areas of for example, where we are in Western Maryland, and you see the mountains in Western Maryland, and how huge they are, and in West Virginia, and some areas of Western Pennsylvania, and you go through these mountains, or you're going to upstate New York, and you ride through these, these various areas in which these mountains are huge for miles and miles and miles, in which roads and highways have been cut out through these mountains, and you're riding through them. If you see the enormous stature and how solid and how big these mountains are, if the kalam of Allah, if that which is between those two particular covers right there, of that mushaf on those pages, were given to these particular things, this creation of Allah, this would have hum- humbled itself in humiliation, humbled itself in humility, excuse me, and out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A human being is made up of something that can be crushed by a mountain, by just a piece of a mountain, can destroy a human being. Huh? And you mean to tell me that the human being, as soft as the human being is, as weak as the makeup of the human being is, the human being cannot humble itself, have humility, and not soften himself, and not break himself down in his desires from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in his book? And the heart of the human being, you mean to tell me that the heart of the human being in which is absorbing the Qur'an, in which the Qur'an goes into, is harder than a mountain when it is not pondering and reflecting and acting according to what Allah Ta'ala has sent down from the basics of the most important thing and that's submitting to Allah alone and worshipping Him based upon Tawheed. This is the greatest command. This is the greatest thing that should cause the heart to submit. And Shaykh Abdul Razak, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Ibn Abdul Muhsin, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, Afwan, he makes a few waqafat. He brings some few, a few points from this particular verse right here. And he says, هذه الآية الكريمة فيها بيان فيها بيان عظمة القرآن وقوة تأثيره. 
And this noble ayat here explains the great, tremendous nature of the Qur'an and the strength of its effect upon the creation. وَأَنَّ فِيهِ مِنَ الْمَوَاعِذِ وَالْقَوَارِعِ وَالْوَعِيدِ وَالتَّهْدِيدِ وَالذِّكْرِ لِأَذَمَةِ الرَّبِّ جَلَّ وَعَلَى And in it, in the Qur'an, are admonitions, are things that shake the soul, are things that wake up the individuals, are threats, are challenges, huh? is remembrance and reminding the people of the greatness of their Lord, the Most High. مَا يَكُونُ لَهُ الْأَثَرَ الْبَالِغْ لِمَنْ أَقْرَمَهُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانُهُ وَتَعَالَى بِالْإِنَايَةِ بِالْقُرْآنِ تَدَبُّرًا وَتَأَمُّلًا وَعَقْلًا لِمَعَانِيَ الْقُرْآنِ وَدِلَالَتِهِ And also what is in the Qur'an is something that contains a far-reaching effect for the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored, has given the honor of being able to concentrate and pay attention to the Qur'an and ponder over the Qur'an and comprehend the meanings of the Qur'an and the proofs that are contained in the Qur'an that give indication to the greatness of Allah and the fact that Allah deserves to be worshipped alone and everything else. وَهَذِهِ الْقُوَّةِ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْكَرِيمِ قُوَّةُ التَّعْثِيرِ لَا تَنَالُ كُلُّ أَحَدٍ وَإِنَّمَا يُحَسِّلُهَا مَنْ يَمُنُّ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانُ وَتَعَالَى عَلَيْهِ بِالتَّدْبِيرِ الْقُرْآنِ And this power of the Qur'an, it is a power that causes an effect upon a person. Hmm? It's not a power type of power if you take the mushaf and you hit someone with it, you knock them out. No. It is the power within the words of the Qur'an, in the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is not obtained by everyone. It's not obtained by everyone. It is only obtained by those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favors, and He gives them that gift of being able to ponder over the Qur'an. وَلِهَذَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ الْقُلُوبِ تَسْتَمِعُ إِلَىٰ آيَاتِ الْقُرْآنِ وَلَا يَكُونُ لَهَا أَيُّ تَأْثِيرٌ وَأَيُّ تَأَثُّرٍ بِذَلِكَ السِّمَاعِ And he says, many people, many hearts are exposed to the Qur'an. Many people listen to the Qur'an. The hearts are exposed to the Qur'an. They listen to the ayat of the Qur'an and there is no effect whatsoever. There is no effect whatsoever that is a result of that which has been heard. So, لهذا يقول ابن ابن قيم رحمه الله تعالى في كتابه مفتاح دار السعادة وهو يتكلم عن آيات الله القونية ثم ذكر منها على الجبال وفي أثناء حديثه عنها أورد رحمه الله تعالى هذه الآية ثم قال ما معناه. And based upon this, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi, rahimahullah ta'ala, the great scholar, the tabib al-Qulub, the one who was a doctor of the hearts, a physician of the hearts in his book, what is entitled Miftah Dar al-Sa'ada, the key to the abode of happiness. He spoke about the ayat of Allah Ta'ala that we see around us, qawniyan, qawniyatan, right? That which you see in the creation, that are signs of the existence of Allah, signs of the lordship of Allah, signs that point to the fact that Allah deserves the right to be worshipped. He was speaking about these signs in this book, Miftah Dar al-Sa'ada, and he mentioned from amongst these signs are the mountains. From amongst these signs are the mountains. And within that which he mentioned about the mountains, he brought and presented this ayah here. And he said, Ajiban li mudgatin sagiratin min al laham la tataathur wala unzila had al Quran ala jabal la tasadda. He said, It is an amazing thing when you look at this very small piece of flesh. This small piece of meat within the body of the human being, meaning the heart, that is not affected whatsoever from the Qur'an. But had the Qur'an been sent down upon a mountain, then the mountain would have crumbled. The mountain would have cracked. Hmm? He says, لَجَابَ الْأَصُمْ الْأَصْلَبْ 
هو الصلب لو أنزل عليه هذا القرآن لتصدع من خشية الله a mountain a mountain that is what a sum mountain can't hear anything mountain can't hear the recitation of the Quran right إلا أن يشاء الله لا سبحانه الله تعالى of course he does what he wills we want to make the mountain to hear he can make the mountain hear but in general the mountain is not something that is hearing not a thing that hears It is a solid structure, right? With no hearing whatsoever. Deaf. Deaf. Had this Quran been sent down upon it, it would have cracked. It would have crumbled out of the fear of Allah. وَكَثِيرٌ مِنَ الْقُلُوبِ تَسْتَمِعُ لِآيَاتُ الْقُرَانِ الْكَرِيمِ وَلَا يَكُونُ لَهَا أَيُّ تَأَثُّرٍ وَأَيُّ تَأَثِيرٍ عَلَى تِلِقَ الْقُلُوبِ And many of the hearts are exposed to the Quran. Yet, when the Quran is heard, Does the Qur'an go into these hearts and does it affect these hearts or not? Does it cause any type of effect? وَذَلِكَ لِقَوْنِ تِلْقَ الْقُلُوبِ غَافِلَ And that is because these hearts are number one, the reason, heedless, distracted, busy with something else. Right? وَالْقَلْبُ الْغَافِلْ لَا يَنْتَفِعُ بِالْآيَاتِ وَالْمَوَاعِظِ The heart that is heedless, the heart that is distracted, the heart that is preoccupied with something else will not be able to benefit from the Qur'an or, or the ayat of Qur'an or any admonition. Hmm? This is why you see people can sit and, and, and listen to a powerful lecture or a powerful khutbah, right? Or listen to the Qur'an that know what the Qur'an is saying and it doesn't cause any effect whatsoever. Hmm? SubhanAllah. You hear verses of the Qur'an and it is important that we understand what the Qur'an is saying because it helps us, especially when we're going through situations. Right? I was riding in the car the other day, I heard the verse, Allah Ta'ala said, and the reciter was saying, أَلَيْسُ اللَّهُ بِكَافٍ abda." أَلَيْسُ اللَّهُ بِكَافٍ abda." And the reciter recited it twice. I said, SubhanAllah. This is telling you. We're speaking to you. Isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sufficient enough for his servant? Whatever you're going through, whatever situation you're in, whoever's out to harm you, whatever's going on, whatever difficulty or whatever or something getting your way, or whatever you think you're relying upon, or you're afraid of, alayhi Allahu bi kaf and abda. This is what he was telling the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it makes you think about that. Subhanallah, look what the Messenger of Allah was going through. When this verse was being revealed, he told him, isn't Allah sufficient enough for his servant? وَيُخَوِّفُونَكَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِهِ And they try to instill fear in you about those who besides Allah that they worship, of their idols, or the shayateen. Huh? This is a tremendous verse. Right? وَمَنْ يُدْلِلِ اللَّهُ فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ هَاد And whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the ghost astray, then he has no guide for him whatsoever. This is a powerful verse. Powerful statements from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we're supposed to approach the Qur'an. When we hear it, it's supposed to affect us in that particular way. You hear something like that, I don't care what's going on in your life at that time, this will make everything disappear. This will make everything disappear. You talking about the creator of the heavens and the earth being sufficient enough for you, got your back, taking care of you, subhanAllah. Khalas. Khalas. Right? Not to worry about anything. So Ibn Qayyim, he goes on and he mentions, he says, وَإِنَّمَا الَّذِي يَنْتَفِعُ هُوَ الْقَلْبِ أَلَّذِي يَعْمَلُ عَلَىٰ عَقْلٍ وَعَلَىٰ عَقْلِ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ But the only one that benefits, the type of heart, is the heart that sits there and comprehends and acts upon its comprehension. Who utilizes, rather, their, their comprehension to focus on the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? وَقَدْ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى كِتَابٌ أَنْزَوْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُ آيَاتِهِ وَيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ Allah Ta'ala, he says about his book, that we have sent this down to you as, a, as something that is mubarak, something that contains an abundance of good, a tremendous amount of continuous goodness. Why? In order that they may ponder over its ayat, and those who have knowledge may remember may be reminded, may think to themselves. 
Allah Ta'ala also says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ إِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Allah asks a question. Do they not ponder over the Qur'an? Saying that this is the reason for it. Had it been from other than Allah, then they would have found in it many contradictions. Many contradictions. Allah Ta'ala, He says, قَدْ كَانَتْ آيَاتِ تُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَقُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ تَنْكِثُونَ مُسْتَقْبِرِينَ بِهِ سَامِرًا تَهْجُرُونَ أَفَلَمْ يَتَدَبَّرُوا الْقَوْلِ Allah Ta'ala, he says, that our ayat are recited upon you and you are turning back on your heels. You are paying no attention. You are turning away, running away while the ayat are recited upon you. Out of arrogance, you are making hajr. You are boycotting this Quran. Afalam yaddabbaru, afalam yaddabbaru al-qawl. Is it not that they have really pondered over the statement that's being said? Ibn Qayyim, he goes on, he says, لَوْ أَنَّهُمْ تَدَبَّرُوا الْقَوْلَ الَّذِي هُوَ قَنَامُ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى لَمَّا نَقَصُوا عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِهِمْ وَلَحَصَلَ لَهُمَ الْفَلَحِ وَالسَّعَادَةِ وَالرِّفْعَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ he said, if they would have pondered over the statement, if they ponder over the statement, and it is the speech of Allah, then they would not have turned back on their heels. And they would have achieved success and happiness. And they would have been elevated in this life and in the hereafter. Elevated. Right? In this life and the hereafter. And this is what the Quran does to an individual. The Quran is something that's going to either elevate an individual or it's going to lower an individual. Right? It's going to raise an individual or it's going to disgrace an individual. The Qur'an is going to be either hujja lahum or hujja alayhim. It's going to be a hujja for them or it's going to be a proof for them or a proof against them. Right? Ibn Qayyim, he goes on and he says, لِأَنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ كِتَابٌ أَنزَلَهُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانُهُ وَتَعَالَى لِيَصْعَدَ بِهِ مَنْ كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ Because the Qur'an is a book that was sent down from Allah so that the person who is from the people of the Qur'an will become fortunate by way of the Qur'an. Fortunate how? With wealth because they utilize their learning and their knowledge of the Qur'an or their ability to know how to recite and teach people to earn money from it? No. No. That's not the reason. بَلْ لَا سَعَادَ إِلَّا بِالْإِنَايَةِ بِهَذَا الْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِينَ Rather, there is no fortune, there is no happiness, there is no satisfaction like being able to be concerned with the Qur'an. He goes and he mentions, قَالَ اللَّهُ أَزَّ وَجَلْ فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَىٰ فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَ هُدَىٰ فَلَا يَذِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَىٰ Allah Ta'ala, he says, that if there comes to you from me, guidance, meaning the Qur'an, and whoever follows my guidance, meaning the Qur'an, فَلَا يَذِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَىٰ He will not go astray, he will not be led astray, and he will not be amongst those who are miserable and unfortunate in this life or the hereafter. Ibn Qayyim, he says, وَنَفْيُ الضَّلَالِ فِيهِ إِثْبَاتُ ضِضِّهِ وَهُوَ الْهِدَايَةِ So negating, misguidance, negating from the person who holds on to the Qur'an misguidance is an affirmation for its opposite. And that is what? Guidance. Negating from that person going astray is affirming that he'll be upon what? Guidance. وَنَفْيُ الشِّقَاءِ فِيهِ إِثْبَاتُ, إثبات ضِدِّهِ وَهُوَ السَّعَادَةِ And to negate misery and misfortune is an affirmation of what? It's opposite. And what is the opposite of misery and misfortune? What? Happiness, satisfaction, and fortune. Right? فَمَنِ اتَّبَى هُدَى اللَّهِ سَعَدَى وَهُدِيَ أَصُعِدَى وَهُدِيَ إِلَى صِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمِ That the person... Who follows the guidance of Allah will be the person that will be happy, the person that will be fortunate, and the person who will be guided to the straight path. وَفِي أَوْلِ هَذِهِ السُورَةِ سُورَةُ الطَّاحَةِ الَّتِي مَرَّ مَعَنَا قَوْلُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى قَوْلُ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَبِفِي تَمَامِهَا فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَى In this beginning ayahs of Surah Al-Taha, Allah's statement, 
And if there comes to you from me guidance, قال الله عز وجل في أولها ما أنزون عليك القرآن لتشقى. Connecting that to the first ayats of, the, of, of that surah. Right? We have not sent down this Qur'an upon you so that you will be from amongst those who are what? People of misery, people of misfortune, people of loss. Right? وَقَدْ ذُكِرَ فِي كِبِ التَّفْسِيرِ أَنَّ السَّبَبَ النُّزُولِ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ أَنَّ الْمُشْرِكِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ أُنزِلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم لِيَشْقَ بِهِ هُوَ وَأَسْحَابُهُ and this, some of the books of Tafsir have mentioned that the reason that this ayah was revealed is that the people of Shirk, they said that indeed this Qur'an has been sent down to Muhammad and his companions so that they can become miserable. They can be people of misery. Alright? So, Allah, connect this to some of the people who ascribe themselves to Islam today. They say, holding on to that Qur'an, you're going to be, you're going to be miserable. You're going to live a life of hardship. You're going to live a life of difficulty. We need to make tajdeed of the nusus. We need to go back. We need to, we need to make i'adah to the nusus. We need to go back and we need to reevaluate the verses of the Quran and see how they apply in this day and time that we're living in. We can't understand it the way the companions understood it. If you understand it in that way, the way that it was sent down, you're going to have a difficult life, brother or sister. This is a bit of fi hadha. This is an innovation in this day and time. I'adah to the nusus. Right? And there are those people who are very well known speakers and celebrities who speak about this. Reevaluating the text, reevaluating the law, the sharia. This is a musibah. So it says, فَقَالَ جَلَّ وَعَلَّ مَا عَذُوا مَا حَذُّ الْعَبْدِ مِنَ الْإِنَائِتِ بِهَذُ الْقُرْآنِ عَذُوا مَا حَذَّهُ وَنَصِيبُهُ مِنَ السَّعَادَةِ And as much as the servant increases in his portion in the amount of that he takes from the Quran and receives from the Quran and is concerned about the Quran this is as much as his happiness and the portion of his happiness he will receive in this life Allah has refused Allah has refused that you can find happiness in anything other than the Qur'an, other than his revelation. وَلِهَذَا مَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنَ الْقُرْآنَ نَالَهُ مِنَ الشِّقَاءَ أَلَّذِي هُوَ ضِدُّ السَّعَادَةِ بِحَسَبِ بُعْدِهِ عَنْ الْقُرْآنِ وَإِرَادِهِ أَنْهُ And based upon this, whoever turns away from the Qur'an, meaning they don't study the Qur'an, they don't recite the Qur'an, they don't implement the Qur'an, they don't ponder over the Qur'an, then this person will receive his amount of misery According to, and which is the opposite of happiness and bliss, in accordance to the amount of, in accordance to how much he has turned away from the book of Allah. The person has turned a little bit away from it, he's going to get a little bit of misery. Right? The person has turned away a little more than that, he's going to get more misery. And the person who has turned totally away from it, he's going to be completely miserable. Hmm? You come acquainted with the book of Allah, you come close to the book of Allah. Let something distract you from the book of Allah and see how you feel. When you become acquainted with the book of Allah, close to the book of Allah, in a habit of dealing with the book of Allah, studying it, pondering, being in areas and places with people who are reminding you of it, classes, all of these things, understanding its rulings, understanding the language of the Qur'an, get put in a situation where you get distracted from that and see how you feel, see how your soul is uneasy, see how you don't sleep right, see how you don't wake up right, see how you don't function right throughout your day. This is the reality. And it's true. This is medicine. Right? And we are all sick, so we need this medicine. Sahih? You agree, right? We're all sick, right? No doubt. Each and every one of us, human beings, sick. And the only thing that treats us and treats this soul the best, better than medicine, is the Quran. Hmm? We're sick. And we need this medicine. Alright? Every day. So then the Shaykh, he goes on summarizing. He says, وَلِهَذَا قَدْ يَكُونُ إِنْدَ الْمَرْءِ حَذٌ كَبِيرٌ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ حَيْثَ الْإِنَايَ بِأَلْفَاذِ الْقُرْآنِ لَكِنْ لَا يَكُونُ لِقَلْبِهِ نَصِيبٌ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ حَيْثُ التَّدَبُّرِ وَمِنْ حَيْثِ تَدَبُّرِ الْقُرْآنِ 
وَأَقْلِ مَعَانِيهِ He says, a person can have a large portion of the Qur'an, meaning memorized. Right? This is an admonishment for us. A lot of Qur'an memorized. A lot of Qur'an, the person reads it. But how much concern with the, or the person has a concern with the wording of the Qur'an, but the heart does not have any portion of the Qur'an of reflection and pondering and comprehending its meaning. وَقَدْ قَالَ النَّبِيُّ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالسَّلَامِ أَنِ الْخَوَارِجِ يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنَ لَيْسَ بِكِرَاءَتِكُمْ إِلَى قِرَاءَتِهِمْ بِشَيْءٍ وَلَا صَلَاتُكُمْ إِلَى صَلَاتِهِمْ بِشَيْءٍ The Prophet ﷺ said about the Khawarij, this deviant group who removed themselves from the body of Muslims, the main body of Muslims, and they spilled the blood of Muslims and they revolted against the Muslim leaders, until this day they still do, and caused corruption in the land. They are reciters of the Qur'an. Your recitation is nothing compared to their recitation. They recite the Qur'an. They recite it. This is why Ibn Abbas, he said, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, when he was narrating what happened, when he went and he made the munadara, he made the debate with them, right? He said when he entered to their camp, before he got into their camp, all he heard was sound like the buzzing of bees. It was them reciting the Qur'an. Right? Their Qur'an, your recitation, in comparison, is nothing in comparison to their recitation. Your salah is nothing in comparison with their salah. And we're talking about al zahir We're talking about the outwardness. We're not talking about the inward reality of it, of your salah and their salah, right? Right? But this shows the importance of what? Being able to understand and comprehend the meanings of the Qur'an and ponder over what Allah is saying and not just the mere words, right? Not just the mere words. What is being said, even if a person understands the Arabic language. But understanding what is the intent behind these words, what does Allah mean, what does He intend, and what did the Prophet ﷺ, how did He implement these, and how did He show us the tafsir by way of His actions to this verse here. Hmm? And this is very important. He says, يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنَ كِرَاءَةً كَثِيرَةً جِدًّا فِي اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ They used to recite the Qur'an in abundance, in the night and the day. يَقُولُ لِلصَّحَابَ وَالصَّحَابَ كَانُوا أَهْلُ إِنَايَةٍ عَظِيمَةٍ بِكِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ Prophet Sallam said this to the Sahaba. And they had a strong concern. And they paid attention to the Qur'an, but he said this to the Sahaba. Your recitation is nothing in comparison to their recitation. Hmm. He goes on and he says, لَيْسَ قِرَاءَتُكُمْ إِلَى قِرَاءَتِهِمْ بِشَيْءٍ يَعْنِ إِنْدَمَا تَقَارَنُونَ الْقَدْرِ تقارنون القدر الذي تقرؤونه من القرآن والقدر الذي يقرؤونه من القرآن تحقرون الذي تقرؤونه وتحقرون الذي تقرؤونه When you compare, if you want to compare the amount of Qur'an and how much Qur'an that they are reciting constantly over and over and memorizing, this is what he was saying. How much compared to yours, you'll be like, wow, it's nothing. Right? He was trying to show that these people Right? They would utilize the Quran. They would recite the Quran. They had the Quran. But did it benefit them? It didn't benefit them. Because they didn't understand it. They didn't comprehend its meanings. They only knew the expression or the wording, the laf. And the Prophet in another narration, he said, يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنَ لَا يُجَاوِزُ حَنَاجِرَهُمْ And they, they recite the Quran, but it does, not go except, it does not go beyond their throats. Meaning into actions, proper actions. Right? The Messenger of Allah وسلم, he also said an authentic hadith Wal Quran hujjatun lak aw alayk. That the Quran is either a proof for you or against you. He says, Limada taratan yakun al Quran hujjatun li sahiba, li sahibihi, wa taratan yakun hujjatun ala sahibihi. Why did the Prophet ﷺ, he said, at times the Quran will be or can be a proof for you or in another time a proof against the person? who is a possessor of the Qur'an, a sahib of the Qur'an. He says, Hujjatun lak, ya man taqra al-Qur'an, aw hujjatun alayk. It could be a proof for you, or a proof against you, O individual who recites the Qur'an. And what is something that is like this, is the statement that we find in Sahih Muslim, and that this is something Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, he mentioned the Prophet he said after a, a lengthy portion of this athar, 
He said, when the Messenger of Allah said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَفَعُ بِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ أَقْوَامًا وَيَضَعُ بِهِ آخَرِينَ That Allah Ta'ala will raise some people by way of this Qur'an and He will disgrace others by way of it. Hmm? This means, this is a proof, this is a, an explanation of what it means to be a proof for you or a proof against you. And both of these narrations are collected in Sahih Muslim. So when we talk about the Qur'an, then the people in their relationship and connection to the Qur'an are divided into two divisions. Two divisions. The first one is the division of the people who يَقْرَأُوا الْقُرْآنَ وَهَمُّهُ أَنْ يَعْقِلَ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ وَأَنْ يَفْهَمَ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ مُتَدَبِّرًا مُتَأَمِّلًا لِمَعَانِ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى The first group is the, uh, is the group of people who this person recites the Qur'an. He has a concern with the Qur'an to understand and comprehend the speech of Allah. Pondering over it, reflecting over it, and paying attention to the meanings of the speech of Allah. This is the first. The person recites the Qur'an and is concerned with it to comprehend, to reflect, to ponder, and to pay attention to the meanings of the speech of Allah. And the second group is bi khilafi dhalik. It's very simple. It's opposite of that. There's no concern with it. It's not trying to comprehend it. It's not trying to pay attention to it. It's not trying to understand the speech of Allah. Period. The first group, يَرْفَعَهُ اللَّهُ بِالْقُرْآنِ or يَرْفَعَهُ اللَّهُ بِالْقُرْآنِ is these are the people that Allah Ta'ala will raise by way of the Qur'an. He will elevate he will honor by way of the Qur'an. And these are the people in which the Qur'an will be a proof for them. And the other group is the group where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lower and disgrace them by way of the Qur'an. And will dishonor them by way of the Qur'an. And these are the people where the proof will be against them. And this is why Qatada. One of these scholars of tafsir, students of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, huma radiallahu ta'ala anhum, he used to say, مَا جَلَسَ أَحَدٌ لِهَذَا الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا قَامَ مِنْهُ إِمَّ بِزِيَادَةٍ أَوْ بِنَقْصَانٍ Qatada used to say, this tabi, one of the students of the companions, he used to say, no one sits for the purpose of studying the Qur'an. No one sits for the purpose of studying the Qur'an or being concerned with the Qur'an except that he will get up from this sitting, either being increased or either be, being decreased. You understand? No one sits for the purpose of studying the Qur'an. Whether it be a lecture where the Qur'an is mentioned, whether it be a khutbah where the Qur'an, Qur'an is mentioned, whether it be a class where the Qur'an is specifically studied in that class, that he sits unless, except that when he leaves and he gets up, he's either going to be increased,